Hello all, the following video is for the purposes of revision, with the aim of presenting a brief recap of the poem, some analysis, some of the questions raised by the poem, and potential links with other poems in the anthology. As always, nothing in this video will be more important than your own reflections on the poem. Recap in this 16-line poem, made up of four quatrains, each with a consistent A-A-B-B rhyming pattern, the speaker is observing the animals and surroundings on a farm, seemingly alone. The poem might usefully be considered in two parts, the first half with the roaming eye of the speaker as they look around, and the second as the inner eye begins to engage with questions of identity. The first half sees a variety of physical details, while the second approaches the metaphysical. With images of straw, a horse trough, ducks, a hen, a swallow and a grasshopper, it is a poem that in some respects offers the airy tranquillity suggested by the title. And yet, beneath that lid, mentioned in the penultimate line, there simmers an array of questions. Analysis To begin with, then, the title. Summer, at least to a British audience, typically conjures images of fun, sun and relaxation. A summer farm perhaps offers a retreat or even an escape from the work-laden days of our duty-bound lives. The title would seem to suggest that the poem will be more about the farm itself, and yet as we proceed, the subject of the poem begins to change. The first stanza finds the speaker at the farm, simply observing the surroundings. The poem begins with a striking simile that contrasts the tame fragility of bits of straw with the explosive power of lightning. The similarity in shape offers a link between the small and seemingly insignificant bits of straw with the force and power of nature at its most fierce. The next line offers another simile with green as glass, describing the stillness of the rippleless water an image of quiet repose. Then come the marginally comic Nine Ducks Wobbling By, to complete a stanza unruffled by any human presence. There is no conscious continuity between the sentences. They are simply the gathering impressions of a roaming eye, untroubled by conscious thought. In the second stanza, the speaker is met with the limits of his perspective. The hen appears to be staring at nothing, but then picks it up, so something comes from seemingly nothing, just as the swallow then emerges from the seemingly empty sky, and just as, later in the poem, after emptying his own mind of all conscious thought, a new, deeper sense of being emerges. The use of enjambment reflects the dynamic bounding flight of the swallow in an image which is both rich and resonant. Some students have suggested that these lines are a symbol for the passage of life. With the barn being our earthly form, the word flickering suggesting the transitory nature of our existence, and the dizzy blue being our disappearance back into the ether from which we emerged. Either way, it is a beautiful image, tangible but fleeting, concrete but curiously elusive. So far, then, with its seemingly random listing of images and comfortable A-A-B-B -B rhyming pattern, the verse progresses with the untroubled simplicity of an easy eye, surveying the farm in peace, without any disturbance from the human mind. But then, at the halfway point and entrance of the third stanza, things begin to shift. For the first time, the speaker appears with the words, I lie not thinking in the cool, soft grass. Here is the first suggestion that the poem is not actually about the farm, but the self that lies beneath that I. At first glance, it is a simple statement of his physical position, lying on the grass, and the use of sejura in the line reflects the gentle pace and relaxation that would seem to define the moment. That use of sejura in slowing the pace of the line mirrors the desire of the speaker to experience a kind of serenity, untrammeled by conscious thought, a bowing to the sentient nature of his being. 
at the expense of the rational, to feel rather than to think. However, the entrance of the words, afraid of where a thought might take me, can muddy the waters. To my line of argument, it is the desire to escape the sometimes oppressive nature of conscious thought, without jobs and duties and desires, dreams, fears, all that clouds our ability to engage in peace with the moment and with ourselves. Only when he has escaped all thought is he free to enjoy the self-discovery that defines the final stanza. So, reason and rationale, so often thought of as the keys to understanding and self-awareness, are here seen to be obstacles. Thus the series of seemingly random images throughout the first two stanzas ultimately provide a distraction and divergence from rational thought, which allows the speaker to delve deeper beneath the pile of selves and discover some kind of essence of being and identity. But, with the entrance of that word, afraid, the previous line becomes more ambiguous. What is it to be feared? Indeed, why is the speaker alone at the farm? Is he fleeing from something? Hiding something? Suddenly that word, lie, seemingly simple and discreet, begins to simmer. It supposedly refers to the physical reality of lying down on the grass. But might it also suggest the avoidance of truth? Is that where a thought might take him, to a truth he would wish to avoid? Is this a comfortable retreat, or would be escape? Lie also appears in the first stanza. Is it mere chance, or a subconscious preoccupation with that idea? Personally, I side with the vision of self-discovery mentioned previously, but the possible existence of dark, psychic undercurrents only goes to emphasise the complex and potentially volatile nature of identity. A volatility reflected in the only moment in the whole poem when the rhyme scheme partially falters with the half-rhyme of grass as. Yet for me, the speaker has his parallel in the grasshopper, who finds himself in space. Here the expression again refers to the physical reality, with the grasshopper emerging in space, having presumably jumped from the grass. Yet there is also a hint of the metaphysical in that idea of finding himself. The grasshopper has had to seek space in order to find himself, just as the speaker has had to remove himself from the clutter of social and perhaps urban existence, to engage with the multiple selves of the final stanza. And so, having begun with straw and water, ducks and swallows, a poem about a farm finally metamorphoses into a vision of identity. This layering of the physical and metaphysical is expressed in the first line of the fourth stanza with Self under self, a pile of selves I stand. The metaphor points to a layered sense of being, with the word under suggesting that parts of our identity are in some way submerged. It appears to be those submerged selves that undergo a kind of awakening in the poem. The enjammed phrase, I stand threaded on time, encapsulates the problematic nature of identifying the self. Firstly, there is the fixed physical entity belonging to each and every moment, literally standing in one place, as so many of us are standing or sitting right now. Yet the delicate but incisive metaphor that follows, threaded on time, shows the speaker's being to be a patchwork collection of selves, evolving through time. Two distinct but inseparable visions of identity, one fixed, one in flux. Here the enjambment neatly encapsulates the philosophy in play, with the two visions separated by the line break, yet joined through the enjambment, just as each moment represents our being as the sum total of all that we have been, and yet, at the same time, only one more stitch in the self we are becoming. It is at this point, 
with the speaker delving ever deeper amid the pile of cells, that we come to the final simile, one of discovery. Here the phrase, farm within farm, echoes the self under self, an echo which reflects the speaker's perception of both farm and himself as merging. Beneath the pile of selves and the lid of the farm, he appears to see some core of his being, implicit in the final word of the poem. The singularity of that word, me, hints at some core essence, but in a way hides so much more than it reveals. Yet there is the hint that after having envisaged an evolving sense of the self, there is perhaps at the base of our being, or in the centre, an unchanging essence of identity, as simultaneously stable but obscure as the word me. An identity which unites the external and internal worlds, the physical and metaphysical, the farm and the self. If, then, we might call it in some sense a poem of self-discovery, it is natural to ask what it might teach us about how that discovery takes place. Conversely, it is not through rational consideration or thoughtful introspection. It appears that only through turning away from the self, emptying the mind, and giving oneself over to sentient experience, can such a discovery occur. As the final see me rhyme neatly encapsulates, it is by looking at the farm that the speaker sees himself. Thus, only by looking outwards is the inner self revealed. And we might also say that such a path suggests a profound link between the external and internal world, that nature is in some sense our mirror, without which we can neither know nor see anything of our own selves. Yet it is, it is in some sense paradoxical that a carefully composed rational construct, the poem, should attempt to dramatise the abandoning of rational thought. Just as each couplet in the AABB rhyme scheme offers a cyclical, unending process of renewal and return, so the speaker looks beyond himself but is continually pulled back by the very consciousness he is attempting to escape. In a sense, the end is undermined by the means. As mentioned earlier, it is a poem pulled in two directions. First, an attempt to identify with the sentient, physical life of the natural world. The second, an inching towards the metaphysical nature of identity and the self. But the speaker must ultimately fall short of both. The poem partly dramatises the prison bars of our consciousness, through which we glimpse and grope at the world outside of the self, seemingly within reach, but always achingly beyond. And so we labour, beings bound between the physical and the metaphysical, belonging wholly to neither, forever pulled in opposite directions, lost amid the pile of selves, exiles in search of a land and a self we might recognise as our own. Some questions to consider. With the speaker attempting to empty his mind in this poem, is thought a tool or an impediment to self-discovery? Can observation of the natural world around us help us to understand the internal world within us? What might we say of the grasshopper's plated face? Could it symbolically represent the unpassable barrier that separates man and nature? Is there a fixed, unchanging element to our identity, or are we forever in a process of becoming? Some links to other poems. With the farm serving as a guide to self-discovery, we might also think of hunting snake, pied beauty, pike, and the cockroach, as poems in which the natural world and the animals within it are there also seen as a presence which illuminates an internal essence. We might also consider Continuum and Horses as poems touching upon the relationship between identity and time. That's all for now. If you have found the video useful, then please do subscribe for more Poetry Revision with Mr. Brooker.